The study of operating systems usually starts with a quick look at the underlying hardware and the realization that this hardware which we should know in a computer is the central processing unit, the memory, the bus system, the input devices such as a keyboard, the output devices such as a monitor. All of these pieces of hardware are controlled by an operating system so it's usual to show an operating system to be sitting on top of the hardware and the operating system is the software that controls the computer hardware that we can think of as lying below the operating system. Now sitting on top of the operating systems we have the various applications that we can run for example a word processor, a spreadsheet, a database, a web browser. All of these are applications and they ultimately control the hardware but they do so with the cooperation of the operating system. So what we're looking at here is a very simplified view of a computer system that has hardware at the bottom, an operating system that controls that hardware, and sitting on top of the operating systems are the applications that we use every day when we use a computer, and those applications ask the operating system to help it control the computer hardware. Let's consider a simplified view of the hardware of a computer system that an operating system has to control. Control. And what we can see is we start off with the computer memory. I prefer to think of this memory as what I term the silicon memory. This is the memory that will hold the operating system. So when your computer first starts, the operating system is loaded into this memory. Of course, this memory is typically random access memory. This is the memory that you're able to take the machine code instructions out when you're running a particular program or a particular application. And when we decide to run an application, such as a word processor, it will be loaded into this memory ready for running and of course the memory may contain the code for a word processor the code for a spreadsheet and the code for a web browser of course a user of a computer and the operating system that goes along with that computer will click on an icon that will load up the word processor but of course it's the operating system that's responsible for loading the word processor code which is after all just a program into the computer's memory ready to be run a computer system will We'll also have a control unit. Now the purpose of the control unit is to actually take the machine code instructions from the computer's memory and then open and close the various pathways through its internal and external bus system to allow machine code instructions to execute and process data and move data appropriately. The hardware also has an arithmetic and logic unit which is responsible for doing all of the calculations in a computer system as well as all comparison operators which ask questions such as is this value bigger than this in which case go back around the loop or execute this bit of code instead of this code and of course the control unit and the arithmetic unit are commonly regarded as being part of the, what's termed the central processing unit and of course a computer is regarded as having input devices such as a keyboard and a mouse which supplies data to the computer system and also we have output devices to which we supply various bits of data output device typically being a monitor or a printer and so on. When the memory has a suitable application stored within it which in truth is just a computer program it could be Word, it could be a web browser but it's nevertheless a computer program what will happen is the control unit will call for the machine code instructions from memory for that particular program and what we're involved in here is something referred to as the fetch decode execute cycle where the control unit keeps on taking the machine code instructions from the computer's memory. Part of that process could involve taking data from the memory and also passing information back to the memory. So here you can see data can be retrieved for processing and saved after processing. For the current executing machine code instruction, the control unit could typically send an instruction to the arithmetic and logic unit together with some data, informing the arithmetic and logic unit to do something with this data and for argument's sake we'll say add it up. And of course the arithmetic and logic unit will do that, will pass the data back and the control unit will redirect this data possibly to the computer's memory via the computer's bus system. Let's now focus in on the memory associated with this particular computer system we've been looking at. And let's look at it at a point of time where it's got the code for application one already loaded. In other words, this could be a word processor. It's also got code for another application, we'll say a spreadsheet. And finally, we'll say it's got uh, the code for a third application, which we'll say is a web browser. 
Now, what we really mean here is all of the machine code for each of these applications, provided there's room in the memory, is loaded and in particular locations. Now, when they're sitting there like this and they are just simply the machine code and none of them is executing, then we refer to these as programs, often called tasks in operating system. And the key here means that you've got all of this machine code in the computer's memory, but none of it is having its machine code fetched, decoded and executed. And we call them programs. Of course, at any one time, one of these applications is actually going to be executing. And I'm showing that with this circle going around, as you can see. Now, that one is called a process. And the other two that are just sitting there, they're called programs. Of course, that's another point in time. Another application will actually start to execute. And I'm showing that here by that circle going around the code for application three. Now, that one is now referred to as the process, and the other two are both programs. Now, for a program to become a process, it has to be in the computer's silicon memory because it's from there that you have the fetch, decode, execute of each machine code instruction taking place. Of course, the reality is an individual on their computer could have many applications of very large sizes, so the memory may not be big enough for all of these applications. That's why we have a disk system. So if we consider the disk to be the area where we have loads of applications that could be run on our computer system, if as users we so wish that to happen by clicking on an appropriate icon, then in response to us clicking on an icon, what will happen is the operating system will say, oh, you want to run an application, do you? Oh, it's not in the computer's memory. It's on the disk. What I'll do, I'll go and get it from the disk. I'll bring it into the computer's memory. And then, of course, when it's in the memory, it starts to execute. In other words, the machine code for this particular application is fetch, decoded, and executed. And I would like to point out that you only run your programs from the computer's memory, not from disk. The disk simply supplies the memory with the code that is to be run. And of course, when you need room for other applications to run, the operating system would send this back to the disk and bring in a different application to run. Or you could have a situation where the memory has two, three, maybe four applications within itself, and they will run when it's their turn. Let's return to this particular schematic diagram here of a microprocessor system or a computer system. It's very much simplified, but what it does do, it shows us the main component parts of a typical computer system. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to remove the input and output from the diagram and take away those labels there. And I'm going to move this to one side, and I'm going to introduce um, a disk. Now, if you're going to study the theory of operating systems, I strongly recommend that you have a mental picture of this schematic diagram with you at all times. And of course, the input and output, which I've moved out of the way for the time being, just to give me a little bit more room on this particular slide. But essentially, what you're looking at here allows us to focus in on what the operating system does in terms of what it controls. Let's start off by looking at the memory, the silicon memory, the random access memory. Now, the operating system is responsible for knowing what's stored in this memory. And what I mean by that, it must know where the machine code is for each individual application that's currently in the computer's memory. The start address of that application, if you like, the address of the first machine code instruction for that particular application. So it needs to know this because when the user clicks on an icon to start off one of the applications, it has to say, oh, they want to run a word processor now. Right. Well, that is in this location. So off it goes to that location and fetch decodes the machine code from that particular location. Of course, the user may then click on something else and it says, oh, right, I found that. That one because it'll keep a table of where all of the start addresses are for all of the applications now this is just something it does I'm just trying at this particular stage give you a feel for what we have to control using the operating system so in other words we need code to manage the memory and this code is part of the operating system let's now turn our attention to the disk the disk contains the file system for the computer now, the file system will have all the files that have been installed on the computer, such as the various applications, word processors, web browsers, and so on. It will also contain all of the data files that the user has saved when they have actually been using some of these applications. Now, what the operating system has to know, it has to know where on the disk it can find those files. So it has a table. 
and the table will say oh you want to run application word processor do you right well it's not in memory it's on the disk I'll go and locate it on the disk. So that's what we have to do. We have to have software which locates where files are on the disks, whether those files represent the applications that are going to be run or whether they represent the data that those applications use. Of course, other things need to be controlled. For example, some of the files will be read-only. So the operating system has to keep track of issues like that, which files are read-only, which files are read-write, which files are execute files, and so on. So we can see that we need something that is responsible for controlling uh, the file system. In other words, we need code to manage the files. Let's now turn our attention to the central processing unit and we'll do so by looking at a particular scenario. Let's say in the computer's memory we have two applications, one a word processor and one a web browser. Now web browser is currently executing and what is happening a web page is being downloaded. Then the user decides to spell check a document so they click on spell check. To all intents and purposes to the user it would appear that both processes are executing because we can see the spell checker running and we can see that the web page is currently downloading because images and texts are appearing as we look at the screen. In fact what is happening down at the machine level is the machine code for one of the applications is executing for a brief period of time and then the operating switches the execution to the other application and its machine code is actually executing. So the central processing unit is allocated to each of the applications in turn. So the operating system needs code to manage access to the CPU time so every application has its fair share of time. At any particular point in time a user of a computer system could come along and plug into a USB port a device of some kind and at that particular point the operating system has to say a device has been added I better do something with that a particular device so in other words the operating system also has responsibility for all of the devices that are connected to a computer consequently it's important that operating system has code to manage devices connected to the computer like all software systems it's important to take the whole and decompose them into chunks and an operating system is no different so we've just looked at all the types of things an operating system is responsible for so when we write the code for these particular systems we have to realize that we need code to control the memory i.e. where the applications are in the memory and this code forms something referred to as the memory manager we also have the file manager and this is responsible for controlling the file system i.e. where the files are on a disk, whether they're read-write, whether they're executable files and so on. In addition, we need to be able to allocate processor time to individual applications and the code for this is regarded as being part of something referred to as the process manager. And of course, we also have devices that can be added and taken off computer systems and we have to allocate and deallocate the resources for all of these devices. So something needs to control that and the something is referred to as a device manager and it contains all of the code for controlling the devices on a computer. So here we can see the typical managers that exist in all operating systems. Check out the supporting website for these videos and consider subscribing to the YouTube channel and you'll get an automatic update every time I upload a new video.